Um, all right, so uh, welcome everybody. This is another episode of uh, MedTech Trends. We've got with us uh, Richard Cheng today, and we'll uh, dive into um, a product that he's been developing over the last couple of years, him and his team, um, and uh, the product is called River Tome. So we'll get into that a little bit. So welcome, Richard. Thank you, thank you. All right, so I guess, um, but, you know, just to kind of start off, I mean, this is, uh, uh, I wanted to first congratulate you uh, openly uh, on uh, on the uh, graduating or earning the, the dissertation PhD. So it's been a long time coming. Uh, congratulations on that. And I guess let, let's talk a, a little bit about um, what, you know, what, what was the, the project that you were working on um, over the last couple of years? What problem is it solving? And, um, you know, how did you come up with the idea to begin with? Well, our lab was tasked with uh, coming up with a medical device to help treat patients suffering from uh, full thickness burns. Um, so we understood that the current standard of care is using split or full thickness uh, graphs, um, and, and that really is not a great method. Yes, even though it works um, well to cover the, the patient body, um, the reality is that you, you have to have a secondary surgery, which comes with its own complications. Uh, in addition to that, uh, for these very severe large area burns, there's sometimes simply not enough uh, healthy skin for you to extract. So yeah, we worked with a um, surgeon collaborator who challenged us to come up with a new way of delivering uh, cells and biomaterials uh, such that they can be used to help these patients. And, and that's exactly what I did with uh, my advisor, Axel Gunther at the University of Toronto. Uh, with the Institute of Biomaterials and Biomedical Engineering, we developed this uh, handheld bioprinting instrument uh, to uh, deliver these cells and biomaterials. That's it in a nutshell. So there's definitely a lot to unpack there. Um, yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll try to take it bit by uh, bit by bit. Um, and, you know, full disclosure, it's not uh, it, it's not my uh, my uh, area of expertise. So I'm going to try to understand this from a, from a layman's terms uh, perspective as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, so the uh, Rivertome uh, bioprinter. So it's it's described, you know, in, in a single kind of statement. It's a handheld bioprinter for cell delivery uh, to promote wound healing. And yeah, I guess that the main kind of patient population that, that you were really going for is, so th these are patients that have like severe bone burns. So we, we typically hear of like, you know, first degree and second degree and third degree burns. Um, so like third degree burns from what I understand, this is like, this is, you know, severe accident. So, you know, the, you know, the, it's, the burn is, is gotten pretty deep into the skin, even That's potentially exactly down right. to the bone, right? Yeah. So uh, when, when people say first, second or third degree burns, it's really a, a matter of how deep the uh, injury has reached. So you know how the skin is actually a, uh, a layered architecture. So there's the epidermis, which is the layer on the very top, and then the dermis, which is underneath that, and then the hypodermis underneath that. Uh, so the first degree of burns is really just an inflammation of the first layer. And as you go down in the severity, you damage more and more uh, of, the, of the different layers. Beyond depth, there's also area. So uh, for patients who are suffering from severe burns, usually it's a 40% uh, total burn surface area that's, uh, that's affected. Yeah. So first of all, I didn't really realize how common these things are. So I um, read a little bit about the, I guess, the epidemiology of it, but there are a couple hundred thousand, like 500,000 you know, severe burn cases, I guess, per, per year globally, right? And then a yeah, lot yeah. of these things result in they're so bad, you know, this, these are patients that have to be hospitalized and, uh, and they usually end up staying in the hospital for, you know, extended periods of time. Under exactly, treatment, yeah. Different yeah. Types of treatment. And the thing is, a lot of the times they also need a very specialized staff to treat them um, and they need to stay in the ward for an extended period of time. So all of this translates into dollars, right? So uh, if there's a way to provide a treatment that can get them quickly treated and quickly out of there, and that's really in demand right now. Remember, the other unique thing about third degree burns is that, um, so you've got the, the area aspect of it, the, the depth. And then I think the other thing that I remember reading about is the, the nerve endings too, right? So yeah. you'd think that third degree sounds worse than second or first degree, but in fact, yeah. it, if it's so bad, it burns the, the, the ends of the nerves in that part of your body, you don't feel it anymore at that point, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. You actually don't feel much pain because pretty much all your nerve endings are, are completely destroyed. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so that's one of the hallmarks of, uh, of severe burn, actually. Jeez. And this could happen for 
like any number of reasons, right? We're talking about like industrial accidents, you know, That's workplace right. hazard type of things. It could be, um, you know, driving accidents, uh, yeah. any of those kind of scenarios. Yeah, and they affect uh, primarily, uh, also they, they specifically target um, children and elderly populations too. It just so happens that they also get exposed to burns quite frequently. Yeah, Jeez. yeah I, I had no idea that this is, uh, yeah, as common of, a, of an occurrence as, um, uh, as I've read about recently. So, um, okay, so what would normally happen, let's say, when a, when a patient goes to um, a hospital? Um, what, what are some of like the, you know, the, the existing therapies, if you will? A patient enters the operating room, and what the surgeon does is debride the, the, the wound. So get rid of any necrotic tissue or any um, unwanted pieces of, of tissue. Um, and then next day, they typically clean the dress, clean the wound, apply some dressing, and then uh, see if whether or not they can um, apply uh, the split and full thickness grafts that I, I talked about previously. If the area is not so large, uh, then these approaches are very feasible. And what to, to expand on what I spoke about earlier about these grafts is that after you harvest the healthy region uh, from your un uninjured part of your body, uh, what the surgeon does is actually use a, um, a, a tool to cut it up into tiny little pieces and then expands it using a mesh so that you can cover as big of an area as possible with the smallest amount of uh, starting material. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, an alternative to that is uh, the use of acellular scaffolds. So commercial off the shelf uh, kind of scaffolds that you can just open the package and then apply it uh, to the burn wound. So that's uh, probably another a standard that uh, any new technology will have to uh, uh, meet. So the idea of uh, these treatments, such as acellular scaffolds, is that you're providing a, 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 um, an area for the host cells to migrate inwards and to repopulate it and to begin the wound healing process. Um, and then the most, um, the, the newer products that are coming out, which have to compete with these products, are living tissues. So these can be generated using tissue engineering. And some examples uh, are cast cell sheets where you simply culture patient-derived cells over a, a period of uh, several weeks such that they create this sheet of cells with their secreted extracellular matrix uh, materials and then take those sheets and then apply it. So instead of being this off-the-shelf kind of acellular construct, now you're working with the patient-derived cells but the drawback is it takes several weeks, if not months, uh, thus excluding it for you know, critical uh, applications. So what our lab does is uh, uh, building on that concept of uh, delivering living tissues. Um, so we're interested in using a microfluidic uh, technology to, 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 uh, to do that, um, as well as combining it with the in situ delivery approach, which is delivering uh, these cells and materials directly onto the patient instead of building it elsewhere and then transplanting it afterwards. I'm going to try to compare a little bit because I had to look this up too. So um, we hear about grafting quite a bit. I think, I think that word comes up um, in, um, in, in conversations, uh, yeah. but you know, in terms of what that actually means. So if you're, if you've got like severe burns and this is like throughout your, you know, 40 plus percent of your body, then yeah. the, the grafting approach would be kind of take a, a sliver of, um, of, uh, of dermis, I guess, uh, skin tissue from one part of your body. And yeah. then the way to apply that to a severe part of your, a severely infected part of your body would be to kind of stretch it out uh, in a way, um, which is almost like creating a mesh that allows it yeah. to stretch out by cutting up like kind of little holes and then covering yeah. that, the affected part of your body with that. And then that kind of heals. But I guess... Yeah. I guess it, so like traditionally there, there's some, some challenges around that, right? I mean, there's not only like the, I guess how much of your body you can, how much of your skin you can, you can actually use that's, um, right. that's left over that's un, unaffected to treat the remaining parts. But then there's also, I guess the advantage is um, it's your own skin. So your, your body's going to, it's not going to reject it, right? It's not like exactly. using other skin cells. Yeah, you can tell right on the head. I mean, the, the primary advantage is that you're using your own cells, so there's really no issue of, um, of immune rejection. What's like one of the, the main drawbacks of using uh, skin grafting? Yeah, so the effect that you have to create a secondary um, 
uh, site to harvest tissue. And mm -hmm. then, uh, while there's some published work suggesting that these cells can be expanded up to, you know, one to a hundred ratio, realistically, they can really be only expanded like about one to three or one to 10. So there's still several limitations, uh, especially when you're trying to deal with uh, these large area burns. Yeah. Take a graph from another part of your body, like scarring is still a problem, right? Yeah, yeah, scarring is definitely a problem. And uh, in addition to that, you're kind of just cutting up uh, healthy skin and then distributing it uh, randomly. And when I say randomly, it means that you're not really uh, caring about the, the uh, composition of the, of the skin. You know how I mentioned previously, there's three distinct layers that are uh, organized one on top of each other. But if you, you know, just cut a whole bunch of skin and just randomly dis uh, distribute it everywhere, you lose that kind of micro architecture that's important for um, uh, wound recovery. People don't always uh, think about the skin as being an organ, but it's actually, it is an organ. It's the, it's the yeah. largest one on your body and it's extremely complex. There's a lot of different components to the skin. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, we, and we touched upon uh, some of it, uh, the, the different layers of the skin, the epidermis, the dermis, the hypodermis. There's also things in there like the nerves like, as, that you mentioned, hair follicles. Uh, you have uh, fat cells as well, uh, in addition to vasculature to provide nutrients and waste exchange. So it's mm -hmm. quite a complex system. Although admittedly, it's probably one of the easiest uh, uh, tissues for bioprinting applications, which is why uh, there's been so many studies uh, on that. Because at the end of the day, it's still a layer by layer kind of construct as opposed to different organs in your body, which have very distinct shapes or micro um, architecture that's more challenging to, um, to build. Let's get into like the really kind of cool stuff right now. So th this whole idea of bioprinting, um, I mean, I've heard about this for years and years now. Probably yeah. it's it's probably relatively new. I don't I don't know if it's been around that long, right? Just the general yeah. concept of bio. It's relatively new. I mean, historically, I guess it built upon the concept of traditional three D printing. You know, with resins and and, and plastics or, or or metals even. Uh, but I think it was a natural kind of adaptation to come up with the idea of bioprinting, which is instead of using those metals, those resins and instead use uh, cell-containing biomaterials as bio-inks. Um, and I think uh, the main advantage of these uh, bioprinting strategies is that you really have control over the positioning of where you choose to deliver uh, these cells and materials uh, so that you can uh, emulate the architecture of the target organ. I think that's one of the main advantages of uh, 3D bioprinting. For anybody brand new to, to the idea of bioprinting, um, there's a lot of you know material online that you can find out about all kinds of different applications. So obviously you can uh, you know you can bioprint um, uh, various kinds of tissues. You can you can bioprint uh, bone, um, you know maybe cartilage, you know lung tissues, muscle uh, maybe yeah. maybe not muscle tissues and so on. Um, but what you've been doing is working on uh, a particular kind of device that'll help to bioprint uh, layers of skin. Uh, what was the initial concept and then how did that kind of evolve? Well, the initial concept was actually a stationary platform similar to a traditional uh, 3D bioprinter with a twist in the sense that uh, instead of using these traditional nozzles, which are essentially just a very fine needle to extrude the materials, uh, what our lab did uh, was develop a microfluidic uh, print head. So a microfluidic print head uh, is defined as um, kind of a microfluidic device that has micro channels in it. So these are defined as 100 in the order of hundreds of microns. Um, so the responsibility of these micro channels within this device is to organize the bio inks such that the resulting tissue constructs can be of certain organization and pattern. So for example, we can use this microfluidic print head to generate striped constructs or constructs with islands of cells in them, or even uh, um, you know, building up complexity of the resulting construct, like rolling them into tubes or parallel sheets. Uh, so that's uh, kind of where we started is this uh, stationary platform. And when we talk to uh, potential users of this technology, namely the uh, surgeons that we were thinking of collaborating with. Uh, he was complaining that the materials are so soft that it's 
very challenging to uh, handle and transport uh, from the bioprinter to the eventual patient uh, wound. So that kind of uh, got us to start thinking about, okay, what about, uh, what about trying to deliver these constructs directly onto the patient? What kind of uh, mechanical design do we need to uh, think about to make this happen? What kind of material selection uh, do we need to make this happen? Like what are the, the trade-offs we have to consider? So that was kind of the, the start of this uh, handheld bioprinting project. The, the microfluidic chip. Yeah. So we're talking about something that literally looks like a tiny chip, except that it's got these little channels in it and yeah. the channels can be used to combine different, um, different uh, materials in this, in this case. I mean, it could be biodegradable materials or, or yeah. what have you, but it, it can also be like cells themselves, little, yeah, like right. liquids containing cells. And so, and so the, the thing is, if you've got, um, if you've got a liquid uh, that has all these cells, um, I think even like blood plasma or what have you, how do you yeah. build something solid out of, out of that sort of thing, right? So is there, so this little chip is kind of channeling different fluids, it's combining them, and then there's gotta be some kind of scaffold ultimately. Yeah, so that's right. So, so let me maybe spend a few minutes talking about the biomaterial that we, we, choose to, we chose to extrude. Uh, so the material that we selected was actually fibrinogen, uh, which is a protein that's commonly found in the wound healing cascade. And the primary role of fibrin, fibrinogen, is to become cleaved by uh, thrombin, which is another enzyme, turning into a mesh that uh, prevents further blood loss. So we wanted to take, take advantage of this, so we selected this protein as our biomaterial base. Uh, so we mixed cells with this fibrin uh, to become one component of the bioink, and another component of the bioink in separate channels is the thrombin which I mentioned previously, actually clots this uh, fibrin material. So these two materials come together at the device exit, turning the biomaterial from a liquid state to a semi-solid uh, hydrogel state, which uh, maintains its resolution even on um, physiological topographies, which are, of course, not perfectly flat. So we did spend some time to uh, carefully optimize uh, that. But essentially what, what comes out of this bioprinter, I'm thinking of like literally, let's imagine I have like a burn on my, on my arm, then you use a bioprinter, does it, you know, secrete essentially like a layer um, of, of cells that eventually turn into skin tissue? What it delivers is uh, cells within a biomaterial uh, sheet construct. So it comes out as a sheet and it falls directly on the surface of your skin. Right, so the idea is that these cells, um, depending on what type of cells you deliver, uh, will recruit uh, your healthy host cells to enter the wounded region and begin proliferating, differentiating into the mature um, skin phenotype. Could um, deliver skin cells directly uh, that build uh, by itself instead of needing to recruit from the host. Alternatively, you can uh, add some antimicrobial agents and other aspects. I think the key uh, point about this technology is that the user really has a lot of flexibility in terms of what types of cells, what type of materials, what types of payload he or she is interested in delivering onto the uh, wound site. If your burns are so severe, if they're covering so much of your body that you, you don't really have, um, well, you need a lot of material, let's say. Can you can you work with um, cells from, can you work with a variety of cells? M maybe different parts of your body require different kinds of skin cells? Um, depending on uh, the complexity of the tissue that you want to build. Um, uh, I mean, theoretically, you can deliver as many types of cells and materials as you, as you like, because the, the, the great part of this handheld bioprinter is that the microfluidic chip is the core technology. And this microfluidic chip can be designed so that it can accommodate a variety of different uh, cells and materials. Let me be more specific. You can pattern as many cells as you want uh, if you have enough channels to deliver them. So you can create a really simple device where it's only one cell type. And you just have like meandering channels or something to distribute that one cell type. Or you can have multiple inlets that support a variety of different uh, cells and materials. So it's really up to the user to 
kind of design their own microfluidic pinhead uh, to fit their needs. Yeah. And you touched on this a little bit, but I'm also curious, uh, you know, a little bit more about what, you know, what were the design considerations um, that had to go into it from, a, you know, if you're thinking directly about applying this to, to patients? Yeah, I think one of the biggest surprises that we, uh, we, we encountered was that uh, the surgeons really placed a lot of emphasis on the sterility uh, of the medical device. I mean, as we as engineers and scientists, primarily in the lab, we didn't care so much because it's a generally pretty sterile environment anyway, right? But uh, in the operating room, I guess you want to mitigate that risk as much as possible. So uh, when we showcased our first uh, generation of the handheld bioprinter, you know, it was met with muted enthusiasm because they were like, how do you, you know, clean this thing? Uh, what happens if it gets dirty and stuff like that? So and we went back to the drawing board for our second generation and to design, design um, this handheld bioprinter with a print head that could be easily swapped on and off so that after each experiment, you can simply throw it away, um, as well as having uh, aspects that are easily removed to be UV or steam autoclaved to make sure that the instrument is uh, maintained at the most sterile, as, mo as sterile as possible. The most part about it is it's handheld. It doesn't weigh a whole lot. It can really just be you know, moved around throughout a you know, hospital, yeah. Um, different units as as easily as you know just kind of carrying around a stethoscope really and so yeah. um there are removable bits and pieces and right. um so it's got uh, let's dive into that a little bit more so obviously you want to be able to like you know autoclave the, the whole thing if needed to sterilize it or dunk it in kind of a sterile solution or what have you yeah. it's not that big yeah. to begin with so it's easy to do that sort of thing and very yeah. convenient um, what are the, the different components of the, the device itself? From the, the microfluidic print head, there's also the supporting infrastructure around the print head mechanism. Um, and to be specific, that includes a two degree of freedom rotational print head because one of the objectives we had was to make sure that uh, we can address the heterogeneous topography of a real, real burn wound. So we came up with this mechanism that allowed about 45 degrees in both the X and Y, hence the two degree of freedom, uh, so that uh, no matter what the rest of the instrument is positioned, uh, the, the print head itself is always in contact with the uh, patient's uh, skin. We also included this, um, this gentle spring that provides downward force to make sure that there's always contact, uh, even if the, the surgeon moves forwards or backwards with the instrument. Um, and then lastly, we included a silicone wheel, uh, which uh, serves to guide the surgeon as he or she uses the instrument uh, during the deposition process. Like uh, we wanted to ensure that the resulting sheet that was deposited was as uniform as possible. So it was important for us to make sure that the, the speeds at which uh, these materials are being extruded, as well as the rate at which this instrument is being moved remains predictable, uh, which is why uh, there's fine tuning of the, the materials uh, in terms of how fast they're extruded, as well as how fast the wheel is rotating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are the, that's the, the key uh, mechanisms of the, the printhead. I would say the, one of the most important parts of our, our design. Uh, like you mentioned, there's also the handle because we felt it was important to have a handle so that it can be quite portable. Um, there's also an on-off toggle switch on it so that the, the user uh, doesn't have to you know, go to another separate station to turn it on and off. Um, and then there's also the onboard syringes, which uh, house the bow ink uh, itself. There's also some um, considerations to what types of materials we're delivering, and uh, that's reflected in our uh, design as well. Uh, so to expand on that, we included uh, these hollow structures inside that could house coolant. Uh, so the idea of that is to be able to provide a cold four degree temperature to prevent premature gelling if we were to select collagen based uh, biomaterials, um, which uh, solidify uh, at uh, room or body temperature. So it was important for us to try to avoid uh, premature gelation before it exits uh, the instrument. So yeah, that's just an example of uh, some of the design considerations we had uh, to make 
uh, to kind of accommodate a user that has uh, the desire to use a variety of different materials. It looks like a very simple and easy to use device. And I remember I was reading into this, I was, I was trying to figure out, I mean, realistically, this is almost like a, like an out of the box type of solution, right? I mean, if you were to, if you were a, a clinician who, who's, who's never used this kind of thing before, it's actually, it's, um, it's a complex device and a great design in and of itself, but it wouldn't be very difficult to use, right, in an actual setting. We've tried to design it to be as user friendly as possible. Although admittedly, you know, we still have a lot of work to do uh, to make sure that's completely um, a portable device. Like right now, there's still a control unit that the um, handheld bioprinter has to be connected to. In the future, we're thinking of having everything on board uh, the, the handheld device itself, uh, such that it also runs on battery power. Uh, but yeah, it, it, it's designed to be quite simple. Like uh, in our mind, our vision was to kind of supply this handheld instrument with a bow ink kit that you can simply take out from the fridge uh, and snap on to the appropriate uh, places, attach the microfluidic chip uh, itself onto the front, and then begin extruding just by a switch of a toggle. And then just by turning a dial or, or touching some buttons, you can adjust the, the rates of these materials being extruded or how fast the instrument translates across the, the body. So our idea was to provide, provide kits, but I think it's important to recognize that, uh, you know, if the, if the user is inclined, he or she can, can come up with their own materials. You know, we designed everything around uh, standard uh, syringe parts uh, sizes so that, uh, you know, users can have all the flexibility and freedom uh, they desire. Kind of fast forward into the future a little bit, and uh, you know the the product is already in a clinical setting. There's already a surgeon um, ready to use it, or maybe like an ear doc or something. Um, and a patient comes in, and then you have the the handheld bioprinter, um, it, like a single cartridge of the the bio ink. How how much like as it currently stands, how much of the body could that potentially cover? Depends uh, on a few parameters. Uh, it depends uh, a lot on. The thickness of the construct that you're interested in delivering. Uh, obviously, if you want to make a very thick construct, um, then uh, uh, you won't be able to cover as much um, uh, 2D area because the, the third dimension will be quite thick, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if you're interested in cover, just providing a very thin cover, then, uh, you, then uh, logically you can cover a larger uh, area. Uh, so it really depends on um, you know, your potential application. Like, uh, I think another aspect of this is that the printhead can be swapped in and out depending on the application. So if you have a large area to cover, um, aside from the, the, the volume considerations, you can also uh, speed up the printing process by using a wider printhead, right? Instead of using a one inch printhead, perhaps you can swap to a two inch or a three inch printhead so that each pass cover, covers more area. And, and on the flip side, if you wanna cover very uh, delicate or, or small areas like between the fingers or something like that, then you can easily swap to a, a thinner print head. Uh, so that's why we kind of designed the instrument for to have a kind of a modular uh, style. It was the is the entire product was it developed by by you and your team or was there anything that you guys kind of had to, were able to use sort of off the shelf? Well, like I mentioned before, a lot of the work was started by a previous student in our lab, uh, the stationary handheld uh, uh, machine. Sorry, so the stationary uh, printer. Uh, but then, uh, yeah, me and a few other colleagues uh, built on it, turned it into a, a handheld version. Admittedly, a lot of the components are 3D printed um, and, and assembled uh, manually. Um, but uh, we did try to make sure that uh, we can attach standardized pieces uh, like the like the tubing and the syringes, like I previously mentioned. So yeah, we do have um, you know, commercial use in mind, so that not everything has to be custom made. I think it could be scaled up pretty pretty quickly. But the the most important pieces that um, would have to go into you know you'd have to put some thought into it would be um, like the, the the chip itself and yep. the the type of like bio wing that's being used. Yeah. We would provide uh, the, the print head. We could custom make it according to your specifications. Um, say you wanted to make a three-layer device, then we can make a microfluidic chip that um, 
extrudes three layers of materials all at once. Um, if you want a construct that has stripes, then we can you know, design the print head so that when you press that one button, you can generate the, the stripes. Um, so really, the, I want to emphasize that the core technology is the microfluidic print head itself, and that's our claim. Um, and I believe it's the most important part. So the, the BioInk as well, I'm wondering what kind of process goes into developing that or customizing that? It's actually quite challenging, uh, especially in the application of in-situ bioprinting where you're delivering these constructs directly onto the patient. You have to consider, mo most important of all, uh, whether or not this material can support uh, the cells that's being co-delivered. You know, no matter how good your BioInk is, if it doesn't allow for the cells to proliferate or to remain viable, then uh, we can't use that bow ink. Uh, second of all, uh, since we are using a microfluidic uh, device as a print head, uh, it's important that this material uh, can pass through uh, these microchannels without exerting too much force uh, onto the uh, co-delivered cells. So which is why we, uh, in our final formulation, decided to add some shear thinning uh, materials such that um, it doesn't impact the viability of the cells during delivery. Third, after delivery, uh, after you make the construct, it's important to find a material that's stress yielding uh, in the sense that you don't want it to simply drain away or drip away after, after delivery. So you have to find a material that can maintain its shape, its dimensions uh, immediately and ideally of several you know, minutes after deposition as well until it's fully gelled. So it's really a balancing act between uh, these three aspects um, that uh, that scientists have to have to consider. Like you you can have something that gels super fast, for example, using like ruthenium, which is a heavy metal. Um, but uh, it's at the trade off of uh, po having poor cell viability, right? So these are all things you have to uh, consider. Yeah. And the the device itself can be uh, can be tweaked. I don't know if that's the right word, but it can be kind of modified to to adapt to all those different materials. Yeah, indirectly, it can be um, adapted. For example, if you're having challenges with, uh, you know, shear stresses within the microchannels, then I guess you could, you know, enlarge the, the microchannels or uh, modify the flow rates, uh, stuff like that. Yeah, but I think uh, it's probably better to focus more on the uh, characteristics of the bio ink itself, uh, if you want to keep it universal across all sorts of uh, print heads. Uh, obviously, to, to develop it, you, you've been collaborating with uh, clinicians. Um, has it been tested uh, clinically with, with patients, or is it in kind of pre-patient? Our work right now uh, is in uh, preclinical trials. So that means that uh, all of our work has been on large animals. We've done about four to five uh, porcine models of full thickness burn, uh, but uh, uh, with good reason, then the amount of animal experiments that need to be carried out uh, before you reach uh, first human trials uh, is still numerous. So uh, we anticipate uh, several more years of uh, animal trials uh, that will go in parallel to um, hardware design and biomaterial optimization. What would you say is the, the main kind of uh, vision behind uh, River Tome? It, you know, in the way that it's been developed up until now, and then what do you foresee for, for the future, near future? So our vision for this product is to have this medical device that surgeons can use to deliver cell-containing biomaterials, which compete with existing uh, products to overall increase the, the wound uh, healing uh, of full thickness burns. And, and it's our goal to make sure that this technology exits the laboratory and ends up in the hands of, uh, of surgeons, uh, which is why you know, we made it such a big point to continuously uh, collaborate with our, with our surgeon collaborator at every step of the way. And we found it quite a good learning experience uh, as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've noticed you guys have uh, entered uh, into quite a few competitions. Um, and, you know, some giving kudos, but then others actually uh, providing additional funding as well. Um, so the, the James Dyson Award is one of the ones that really kind of stood out to me. I wonder if you can uh, talk to, you know, any one of these in particular that really stood out to you. So for the James Dyson Award, yeah, we were uh, selected as a national runner-up 
Uh, so we were very grateful for that. And uh, it really kind of exposed our technology to the world. And uh, more recently, uh, we were part of the 3D Pioneers Challenge, which our team was fortunate enough to actually win the grand prize uh, out of uh, an international pool of competitors. So I think if I were to pick one, it would be that most recent one, um, because it really kind of showed that uh, our product uh, seemed to have value, seem, other people seem to value what uh, we could bring to the table. Um, and uh, looking at the outstanding entries from the other countries, you know, we were very um, happy to be uh, honored to be uh, to have been uh, selected. It was an international competition. Did you guys like how, how does that work exactly? Do you go and kind of pitch? It runs every year, and then I think you have to uh, submit a video uh, describing the technology in addition to a full application. Um, and what we did, I think it was in the spring when we submitted it, then we, we got notified of our results fairly recently, only a couple months ago. Um, yeah, there's uh, design considerations. I'm not sure what the criteria are. I guess it's innovation and um, you know, feasibility um, and uh, whether or not it's, it's exciting and, and interesting to the potential user. It has huge application, obviously. We talked a little bit about the, the number of people that, uh, that are affected by severe burns um, globally. So, I mean, the, the upside is, is, is massive. Uh, and again, the convenience of using this kind of device goes a long way. I, um, I, mean, I had a chance to do a little bit of homework. I don't think there's anything else on the market that's quite like this right now that's been commercialized. Um, I know BioInks have been, um, there are a few available on the market. There are, there are companies kind of working on this thing, but in terms of a handheld convenient device and um, with the, the setup that you guys have, I don't know of anything else on the market that that's- there, There's some, for example, the cell spray technology, I would consider that uh, a, a competitor or at least in the same field. Um, the idea behind that is to deliver cells extracted from the patient uh, directly, uh, similar to us, but instead of using a valve printing mechanism, it's more of like an aerosol spray to deliver uh, the components. Mm -hmm. I think one of the uh, cool things about that technology is that you don't really need a, a lab or anything supporting you to, to do this because it comes with a kit um, with the digestive enzymes that the surgeon can just you know, do everything right there and then and then spray it directly after. So we did uh, uh, definitely take a lot of inspiration from that kind of user-friendly uh, approach where you don't need too much supporting uh, infrastructure. Because we don't want this uh, technology to be only in the hands of surgeons who have, you know, huge hospital or research facilities. We also want it to be, you know, ideally, uh, even potentially like um, in in military applications or in, in in more rural applications where there's not as many uh, resources. Yeah, you bring up a good point too. So I have seen a couple of um, videos just demonstrating what that would actually look like and i think it's been used in um on, on patients already the um, can't remember the name of the company but uh, someone in the u.s i remember them using it it's like spray cell or something like that i think it's called um uh, but yeah, yeah it, essentially you would take um a bit of skin digest it into so you just end up with the cells and then that solution gets sprayed onto a burn victim's skin um, yeah. wherever the affected area is and then that that's supposed to kind of grow and heal and, and apparently yeah. doesn't take too long to do. Um, and the, the aesthetic results are also quite positive too, but is there, is there an advantage to using like spray on skin versus like a, a film that would just cover the skin? Spraying a mechanism is, is advantageous because it's quite fast. It, it can cover a large area. It's quite rapidly. Uh, and, uh, well, I guess it depends largely also on the operator's skill in um, using this instrument because you need to uh, provide uniformity manually. Um, so yeah, there's definitely an advantage to it because you're also uh, using your patient-derived patient cells, which is again, uh, circumventing the immune uh, rejection. Uh, but I think one of the major drawbacks is that you're not able to, again, reconstitute the um, architecture of uh, normal skin it's more challenging to build up uh, layers of material uh, if you're use, just using a, a spray technology, uh, which is why uh, we decided to develop this uh, microfluidic based uh, extrusion system to kind of recapture more of the, 
of the architecture of the skin. Uh, so I, I wanted to uh, also kind of dive into, um, you know, a, a little bit about your background. Um, so because you, you started, you've got an interesting background. So you started in, in biology and then you were looking to, you know, I guess, you know, for some, some hands-on kind of real, you know, s skills and you wanted to expand and be able to apply your skill set in a real world setting. Yeah. And then you went off into biomedical engineering. So I wonder yeah. if you could take me through that thought process and how you ended up in uh, doing your PhD in the area. Yeah, I mean, one of my first jobs, uh, for some reason, was working at a research laboratory. So when I was in like 17, uh, I ended up, uh, you know, working at a, at a research lab in Taiwan. And from there, I, you know, got really interested in, in, in research. Uh, so I decided to do a uh, undergraduate degree uh, at the University of Toronto in molecular biology. Um, and then following that, um, you know, I wanted to try something different because I didn't really want to get pigeonholed into just doing biology. I wanted to do something more, a slightly more applied and to build, uh, build devices and constructs, uh, which is why I switched over to the biomedical engineering uh, fac uh, faculty of applied sciences after that for my master's. Uh, and it was a great experience because uh, my supervisor at that time was also a molecular biologist turned engineer. So, she kind of uh, knew where I was coming from and she really helped me kind of get on that path. Uh, so after that, I was more comfortable with, you know, engineering uh, aspects, for example, like um, computer assisted design and stuff like that, uh, which is when I switched over to a more engineering heavy lab, which is my current lab. Uh, and, uh, and since I had a molecular biology background, I could really contribute to this, uh, this, um, this project with the handheld bio handheld bioprinter to act as kind of like a liaison between the, the surgeons with their own research group, as well as the engineers in our research group, as well as my interest in, uh, in mechanobiology and, and cell biology. Yeah. Did you have to play catch up at all? Because you're going from like pure, you know, life sciences into a lot of technical kind of engineering term, you know, yeah. language and terminology and, and um, expertise. Yeah, I did have to do a lot of catch up. Like my first couple of years were uh, quite hard, but you know, I had the fortune of having a good supervisor as well as uh, senior members of the lab, which I shadowed and, and shared um, an authorship on several papers. Uh, so I really learned the ropes essentially um, uh, to help me kind of transition. But I mean, even now I, I hesitate to call myself an engineer. I think I'm still a you know, molecular biologist at heart and um, my work in, uh, in Boston as a postdoc uh, will be uh, me going back to my biology roots, really. <laughs> so I'll, I'll ask you a little bit more about uh, what your next steps are going to be. Um, uh, but I'm also curious, so, you know, for, for anybody out there that also has this bio background, and I think, I mean, to be honest, it, you know, for, for anybody like me, I mean, I, I spent some time uh, in, a, in a lab setting, in a wet lab setting. Um, it, it just wasn't for me, but I was always interested in an in engineering type of environment. Um, and I just didn't know that that was really kind of an option. So is there anything, any kind of advice or any, any pointers you would give to anybody who's coming from pure life science wet lab to, you know, that wants to go beyond that? You can start by looking uh, definitely at the biomedical engineering faculty. Uh, I believe they have more of a history of hiring um, people with traditional biology, biology or chemistry backgrounds. And I think, uh, you know, you're really bringing something to the table too. You know, just, you're not coming in with nothing. You're coming with a perspective of a biologist. Uh, I always joke that biologists or scientists are good at uh, finding out the problems, not really at solving them. And whereas the engineers are good at solving problems, but they don't know what questions to ask. So I think um, being able to combine these two aspects is, is, is really, really powerful. Um, as for specific tips on how to make that transition, I would say uh, look for supervisors who, are, who have experience in you know, this kind of interdisciplinary work, who have collaborative uh, efforts with people who are not uh, in their department only. You know, if they have a history of working with surgeons, if they have a history of working with biologists, then that, you know, that's a good sign uh, of a lab that you can, you can apply to. And if you can show uh, any sort of um, um, evidence that you have a, a knack or interest 
or building or engineering or even like um, mechanical uh, contribution to cell behavior. You know, those are all kind of engineering aspects. Uh, I would emphasize that. Okay, I think another kind of major leap forward in the sense that you're also working uh, in an environment that that A has a strong clinical application. So you know that it's is like translational work. Pure, this is meant to be for that. And then yeah. the other thing is you also have a, a deep interest and, and are think and I think are working toward the commercialization. So there's the, the business aspect yeah. of, of all the work that you're doing too. Commercialization aspect I think is a product of uh, the environments. Uh, more recently, there's been a lot of effort to kind of push uh, PIs, uh, principal investigators and their students to develop technologies that can eventually become a uh, spin-off company. So I can only comment on the University of Toronto uh, because that's my experience, but there's several incubators. Pretty much each faculty has an incubator designed to assist and support uh, startups. Um, so to, to help students who have an idea based on their research uh, t- how, to, how to turn it into a, a commercial product. So uh, I've been fortunate enough to be part of two incubators and they really trained me on how to provide a pitch, how to come up with a business plan. And as a result, you know, I've been successful in several competitions uh, at international conferences uh, because of the training I've received uh, during my graduate training. I always wonder, um, you know, where, where, where does that uh, connection kind of come from? Are they always looking for new candidates, I guess, or is there a push from, does it have to be a push from the lab that you're working in to begin with, um, you know, where the, the PI, the supervisors kind of encourage students to, to go out and look for those opportunities? It's typically the students who hear about these opportunities and then have to convince the supervisor to, you know, stop tinkering with this and let's get it right. up. And to answer your question about the availability, I think um, there's a cohort every year. So as long as you meet the deadline, you know, you can be part of this, uh, this year's training sessions. So there's like uh, weekly seminars, there's like pitch competitions, pitch practices, uh, one-on-one meetings with uh, uh, people who actually have started medical device companies, uh, as well as meeting with uh, people who are in, in a support role like uh, patent lawyers. That's really cool. Um, unique experience that I would say, I mean, there's a lot of people that don't do that and kind of end up getting stuck in a, in a very, um, you know, academic sort of mindset, never right, really yeah. beyond that w- what could be, which is really cool. I mean, in the case of uh, the, the, the Rivertone bioprinter, I mean, hopefully this thing goes, ends up going through successful clinical trials and ends up yeah. in the hands of, of clinicians because I think a lot of good can come from that sort of thing. In terms of your next steps, what are you looking to do next? We'll actually be flying to Boston, you know, if I get my visa on time, uh, in October to begin a postdoctoral uh, fellowship at the Wies Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering. Uh, so my next uh, role will be developing uh, vascular grafts, so uh, blood vessels that are used for uh, transplantation. So I will be able to kind of combine my experience in uh, biofabrication using 3D printing uh, with my um, expertise in cell biology to work with uh, genome editing of stem cells such that they can differentiate into um, these cells that can be transplanted in a vascular construct. Yeah. Kind of raises an interesting uh, point in my mind. So I think maybe one of the, the next steps, um, you know, the, the visions of bioprinting in general is to be able to create entire organs. But I think yeah. one of the, the challenges that, um, that I've heard people talk about is that to create an entire organ, you have to be able to create, you know, tissue that is, you know, almost like kind of living and breathing, so to speak. And to do that, you need, yeah. you need vasculature through these things That's as exactly. they're growing. So is, is that the, the problem that you, you're tackling? Um, not quite, but, um, but uh, to answer your, your previous question, yeah, it's, it's, it's very true that uh, even if you have the technology to generate these very thick constructs full of complexity, uh, the reality is that uh, if you're like around 500 microns distance away from a, a, a source of nutrients, then everything else beyond that will just die. So it's actually quite important to be able to introduce uh, a vasculature, uh, whether that's by uh, integrating uh, vessel, blood vessel cells or by including chemoattractants. Uh, such that the host vasculature can actually uh, penetrate 
through the extracellular matrix to form new uh, new new vessels. Um, what I'm doing in my postdoc will be slightly different. We're actually going to be generating uh, tubular constructs directly available for transplantation. Um, so I guess we have to be quite careful in the sense that it has to be able to link up with the existing vasculature um, uh, sufficiently. Uh, so it's a different set of problems. So let's see if I can get your um, Nostradamus type of prediction over here. So yeah. how, how far away do you think we are from being able to, uh, you know, create entire organs, uh, create uh, complex um, structures, even 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 if they're microcellular structures. I think uh, I think it's pretty doable now. But if if you want it to be actually in patients, I think that's the the challenging part. Um, and I would say five to ten years would be the for our product to finish uh, development and to complete animal trials. Uh, to reach a first in human, but uh, there are several more mature uh, products using the uh, traditional 3D bioprinters, uh, which can uh, have already shown uh, great promise in, in regeneration. Probably five to ten years just to be able to, to build the, the actual um, biostructures, but then on top of that, clinical trials would take an additional, I don't know, couple of years something like that. So it could be a little while before we can replace like a heart or like a lung or a liver. Oh, well, I think it depends on the tissue type. For skin, I think uh, it's feasible to imagine it in 10 years. Um, but for more complex organs, uh, depending on the size and the function, like if you do you want to regenerate the entire organ or just the piece of the organ, like, right? Those are two set completely different uh, objectives. So if you just want to repair like a you know, necrotic area of the heart, um, then really you have to be able to come up with a tissue that can integrate well uh, with the existing uh, uh, organ. So that's a much lower benchmark compared to if you want to regenerate, to create a heart right from scratch. Yeah. To take the example of like burn victims, like one, one step further, if, you, if you've got a burn victim where, um, you know, let's let's say the burn goes like pr pretty deep, and you you had to not just regenerate the the bone in the skin, but then also let's say the the muscle, um, and I don't know part part of an organ that sort of thing. So like kind of like a complete picture, um, yeah. of of therapies using bioprinting for for that type of victim. Like, is that are we even close to something like that? I think we're getting closer. I mean, uh, we've already shown that we can at least generate the the skin by itself. I don't think it's too big of a stretch of imagination to think of uh, using a similar approach to build up uh, different types of tissues. Of course, there's a lot of complexities to it because it's not just cells and materials. It's also how these cells interact with the materials, how these cells interact with themselves and with other cell populations. So even if we develop the technology, we have to be sure that uh, the biology behind it is also a rock solid. People have called um, bioprinting the next revolution in, in medicine. I um, wonder if I can get your, your thoughts on that. Is it really, is it living up to its hype? Does it have that potential? As a scientist, you have to be very careful about what you say. So I, I prefer not to hype things up. Uh, I, I do want, like, um, I do think it's um, very promising. And uh, it's definitely a hot area of research. Pretty much every... Uh, faculty has one or two PIs that are pretty much dedicated or has some interest in 3D bioprinting. And I think that's just evidence that um, there's a lot of interest in this field and that there is a lot of manpower behind it. And it's only going to get more and more impressive as time goes on. Funding as well too, right? This is a pretty funding intensive. Yeah, if you want to buy a commercial bioprinter, they, those can be quite expensive, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, if you want super complex ones. But on the other hand, you know, you can even buy super cheap ones, like a hundred, few hundred dollars, or you can build it our, yourself, like uh, our lab did. So the basic principles of uh, building a 3D bioprinter is not that complex um, if you have, you know, if you have the right equipment and, and, and manpower. Um, but yeah, it, it, more funding would always be welcome, in my perspective. <laughs> Of course. Um, so, uh, Richard, this kind of brings me to uh, my final question, um, and that is, what do you envision for yourself uh, for your career, um, let's say in the next, you know, five to 10 
years and then and then beyond that. I'm very grateful for the opportunities I had in uh, in a research setting, and I think it really fostered an interest uh, to do similar work uh, as I progress in my in my career. So my dream job is to um, have my own research group to kind of direct my own uh, type of research questions, uh, but then I'm not really limited to a, an academic or industry setting. Um, I do want to build work on technologies that will eventually um, end up in, in, in helping patients. So I'm likely going to be in um, you know, medical devices or faculty for biomedical engineering. Um, but yeah, I, I really valued my experience and I, I just want to continue this. And then hopefully my uh, experience in Boston will help me realize that goal. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I hope all, all the, the great work continues um, and, uh, you know, we, we live to see the day where Reverend Tome and uh, future work that you're, you're doing um, enters into clinical practice and a lot of patients can benefit from it and get better using that kind of tech. Um, yeah. But in any case, yeah, lots more work to do. So um, <laughs> you've got your work cut out for you. So it's all, Definitely. it's going to be <laughs> All right. Appreciate you taking time to uh, to explain your your ideas and your thoughts around uh, River Tome today. Uh, so thanks a lot for joining us today, Richard. And uh, I do wish you all the best. I'll I'll hand it back to you in case you have uh, any closing thoughts, uh, and then we'll wrap up. Um, no, I, I think uh, this was a great experience for me. It's for my first time doing a podcast, and I had a lot of fun. It's super cool. And um, for all the students who are interested in pursuing a, a career in biomedical engineering, I would say just go for it. It's, you know, take risks when you are uh, early in your career and don't be afraid to switch fields or to learn new skills because that's always valuable. All right. And with that, um, I'll, uh, I'll, I guess I'll let you get back to yeah. your work and uh, we'll, we'll catch up again um, in the, the near future. All the Sounds best. Good.